Uh, my name is John Gardner. I'm president of the uh, British Educational Research Association in the UK. And I'm also a professor of education at Queen's University, Belfast. One of the things we talked about is different kind of classifications of research and the research assessment exercise. Um, do you think that classifications of research and of researchers is more damaging than good? Uh, I, I think you're referring to the, um, uh, the classification of researchers in the UK under the research excellence framework and the previous research assessment exercise as active or non-active. An, an active researcher implies that, um, or a non-active researcher implies that they're not doing research. I would argue that actually many educationists are doing research but aren't being accepted for the, um, the, the purposes of the research assessment exercise. I think it is damaging. It's divisive. It creates a split in schools of education between those who are considered to be contributing to research in an RAE or REF sense, that's the uh, assessment exercises, um, but, n but are not, and that the others are not good enough to do that. We talk about the community of educational researchers and there's many here at the conference. I mean, when we reflect on this and you reflect on what the educational research community looks like, what is it you see as to all the different aspects? Yeah, well, it's a very diverse community um, with um, many, many different um, fields of um, endeavor, both in the research side and on the methodological side. So there's... Um, uh, the the and, I, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure how the, sh the future shapes up because we have been moving away from our parent disciplines, if you like, for our methods. Our methods would have come from places like sociology and um, psychology, um, philosophy and history, and uh, we we um, we have begun to establish our own kind of variants of these uh, approaches. We have our own unique challenges within an educational context, just in the same way as a, that medical research has many different groups working on many different uh, uh, research contexts. So we are very similar. We are responsive as a body to um, policy changes uh, in, in um, for example, government policy changes. Um, but it is a differentiated response. There are those who are engaged in policy research and they immediately take um, uh, a kind of an active position on, on, on those kinds of issues. Whereas uh, further out from that group, you have people who are more interested in, um, for example, lifelong learning or, or more interested in special needs. Or, and where policy impacts on those groups, then certainly you'll get a, a response very quickly. In the future, I think the diversity will increase rather than decrease. I think the policy impacts will become more diverse and with the kind of economic situation we have at the present it's likely that they will become more strained and that the educational researchers will find not just challenges in trying to solve the many challenges where they work but also the um, finding the funds to do it. You, you made reference to how all the funding and a lot of work was done on one of the reviews and the government um, published a headline, I think, just after midnight before they had a chance to mm -hmm. read the report in detail, I, I, I expect. Um, but why do you think that government and, and the public, um, why do you think they're often so quick to be dismissive of some of the things that we find through educational research? Mm. Well, it's easy simply to say we've got a bad reputation for um, uh, educational research and that we're not convincing that we don't actually make our work uh, transparent and accessible. It's more complex than that. I think there are political issues at play as well. Uh, that government had, for example, established its own primary review and it wasn't all that keen to hear about an independent one. Um, the document would probably have been given to them, and I don't know this for sure, before that particular dismissive um, outburst. Uh, so that they would have had time to read at least part of it, I'm sure. But whether they did or not, they certainly dismissed it. And that is, um, that is something that um, will have impact on the Education Research Committee for some time to come. For a 600-page, three-year study by hundreds of education researchers, the Cambridge Primary Review, to be dismissed in 30 or 40 words by a government minister, 
uh, in a two-minute um, uh, comment to a newspaper is really an indictment on the receptiveness that the public and government have for educational research. There is a question here about how we make the work accessible as well. I mean, if we dumb down too much, we can actually lose the sense of it. So how do we actually achieve um, communication or better communication without seeing our work as dumbing mm. down? Mm. Well, I mean, the, the you've you've touched on a very important issue, Mike. About if we if we make our message too simple, uh, just simply to get it out there. I mean, many of us are encouraged to give a tweet, a 140 character um, description of our research. If we do that, then it is obviously going to trivialise it and make it too simple. But we can do much better with what we do produce. We can produce. Uh, less jargonistic material. We can produce stuff that is more persuasive to the ordinary person, the ordinary well-informed person. We don't need to dumb down. We can retain our academic and research integrity by explaining things better, by mediating them better, uh, simply being more transparent and less um, locked in our own little worlds of educational research. You did say that there is, there is no template to ensure the impact of our, um, our studies and reports and, and our work. Um, so how can researchers then improve the impact and improve communication uh, and, and change the, the perception um, that people may have of their work? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite certain there's no template, but there's, there's certainly good starting points. And those starting points are that the, um, we need to make the research relevant to the people that we're trying to influence, the people we're trying to uh, mediate our insights to. Um, if it's not relevant to them, they're never going to listen. It's simple as that. Uh, but we also need, I think, that uh, in making it relevant to them, we need to make it accessible to them. There's no point someone trying to wade through a 60-page document trying to find out what the main messages are. Um, that might be a criticism of the Cambridge Primary Review, but it shouldn't be because there was different parts to it. But it was a 600-page document, no small uh, item. So we make it more accessible, we make it more relevant. We should also make it more um, persuasive. We should actually be going out of our way to encourage the people who are reading it and listening to us to tackle the same issues in their own minds and to tackle those issues from ways in which we can help them uh, to understand and uh, ultimately um, help them to see what the particular challenges are. I think, Michael, there's no, or Mike, there's no, um, there's no hiding the fact that educational research deals with complexity. And we have to somehow or other uh, help our audiences to appreciate there is no simple answers in education uh, and that it is complex. But what we can keep doing is we can keep chipping away at the block which is our uh, lack of understanding. We can increase our understanding bit by bit of how these complex processes work. So that would be my particular um, idea on, on how to... Um, how, how to improve our, our impact with the wider audience.